so now we'll turn our attention, I know you guys are all excited about this, um, to the talk about the tenuous relationship between police and the police in light of the tragic story of Michael Brown and other um, unarmed African American men being targeted by police without um, cause. Natasha Minsker is a longtime criminal justice advocate with the ACLU. She served as death penalty policy director for the ACLU of Northern California, um, leading the Prop 34 campaign to replace the death penalty with life in prison without the possibility of parole. She's also served the ACLU of Northern California and its 55,000 members in the capacity of associate director. And today she leads the ACLU of California's Center for Policy and Advocacy, um, or Center for Advocacy and Policy yes. here in Sacramento. <laughs> so please welcome Natasha Mitchell. Thank you. It's quite an honor to be here. I just moved to Sacramento a month ago, so you now officially represent me. You are my home chapter. Uh, so congratulations to our returning board members and our new board members. Um, please make us proud. Let me ask this. How many of you in the aftermath of the events in Ferguson and New York, how many of you took action in some way? You went to a protest, you tweeted, you posted something on Facebook. Great. Excellent. So because of you, because people took action, because people went to the streets and blew up Twitter and Facebook with the message that Black Lives Matter, the nation's attention is focused on police issues in a way that it has never been before. We at the ACLU and with our coalition partners have been working on these issues literally for decades. If you go back to the history of the ACLU, which I encourage you to do, you will see that it is abuses by police that really are the founding moments of the ACLU in California. It is not an exaggeration to say for close to 100 years we have been working on these issues. But now the nation's attention is focused, finally, in a way it has never been before. And so we do have an opportunity, we hope, to make change and advance some of the goals we have been working on for decades. Here in Sacramento, legislators and across the country, activists are searching for reforms. What will actually make a difference? And really no consensus has emerged as to what reforms are needed. And that's because the problems we face are too big for one or two simple quick fixes. The ideas that have been put forward are good first steps, but they do not go far enough. So for example, Congress actually passed and enacted a federal bill that requires reporting about the number of police officers who kill someone. That is a good first step. That is something we should have. But it doesn't collect information about the circumstances of the encounter. It doesn't tell us, it doesn't require data collection on the race of the officer or the victim. It doesn't tell us if mental illness was a factor. It's good to know the total number of people who are killed by police. And that is a step forward because we actually don't know that now, so that's good. But it really doesn't go far enough. Because ultimately the goal is to stop the police violence. So to stop the police violence, we have to know the circumstances of what happened. We have to know more about these encounters. So we're looking at what can we do here in California. And we had our colleague Chauncey, who's here today, did some research on this. We're actually surprised to learn that the California Attorney General is actually collecting information about police killings and police shootings. And they're actually collecting more information than the federal government under this new bill requires. But we didn't know, because the AG didn't tell anybody, the last report they issued was in 2005. And the reason is because they didn't make it a priority. They will say lack of resources, Lack of resources means it wasn't a priority to them to make the information public. So what we need to do is make sure that we are collecting the right information and that we are disclosing the right information to us, the public, so that we can take action. Another popular idea is body camps. Pretty much every day we get called by a legislator who wants to talk about body camps. Uh, and I think three bills have already been introduced. In fact, today I was meeting with a legislator, and he said jokingly, is body cams all you guys talk about now? Pretty much, that's how it feels. We do support body cams as an important step forward. 
But body cams raise critical issues of privacy and transparency. Let me ask this. Did anybody besides me see a video that was posted on the Sacramento Bee website this weekend that is a dashboard cam a video of a police officer? Did anybody see this? OK. The rest of you, go home and Google this video. It is absolutely hysterical. So it's a dashboard cam facing the officer as he drives. He's a classic cop. Big white guy, he's bald, and he's kind of driving his cruiser like this. And he is rocking out to a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> he is just driving along. <laughs> so full on, full on, like hair tossed by the bald man. It is absolutely hysterical. And then occasionally he sees somebody on the street. He's from Dover, Delaware, a pretty relatively small town. So he sees somebody on the street, he stops and nods in a mysterious way. And then he goes back to his full on dance. This video is hysterical. You should all watch it. But I'm watching it and I'm thinking, why am I seeing this video? Does Mr. Dover, police officer, actually want the world to know that he's a Taylor Swift fan? Because I'm not sure I want the world to know I'm a Taylor Swift fan, right? So let's think about when these videos get released. And it's not just the officer's privacy, it's all of our privacy. What if I'm sitting in a cafe talking to somebody about something personal and the officer next to me happens to have his camera on? How do I guarantee that he doesn't do something inappropriate with that video? Did any of you hear about the CHP officers who were downloading photographs from cell phones of people they stopped, naked images of people? So some of you have heard about this, right? We're not making it up when we say police do inappropriate things with images that they have access to. So we really do have to have clear privacy protections in place from, for all of us, if body cams are going to become the norm. If we are going to have literally thousands of government employees walking around the streets with cameras on their chest, we need to make sure that all of our privacy is protected. There is the equally important issue of transparency. The whole point of body cams is for us to see what happened. What good are they if we never see the videos of the critical incidents? And under California law, there's actually no guarantee we're going to, as the public, have access to these videos. In fact, California's law on police misconduct is about the most secretive in the nation. If our friend Abdi goes to the Berkeley Police Department and he makes a complaint and he says, Officer Jones is harassing me because I'm a member of the ACLU, then maybe Maybe the Berkeley Police Department will tell Abdi later on what happened to his complaint, if, the office, if they found that the complaint was sustained. Maybe they will tell him that. But they're not required to. They are not going to tell him, if the complaint was sustained, they're not going to tell him what rule the officer violated. And they're not going to tell him if discipline was imposed. And they are not going to give him access to any of the investigation. And he's the man who made the complaint. If I go to the Berkeley Police Department and I say, how many complaints have been made about officers harassing ACLU members, I am going to be told nothing at all. Because under California law, all complaints that we, members of the public, make against police officers are confidential and secret. The investigation is secret. The, the investigation that civilian review boards do is secret. We, the public, have no right of access to any of this information. In other states, it's different. Florida, of all places, has the most open and transparent laws in the country. In Florida, everything is public. The complaint, the allegation, whether it's found to be true or not, and all of the records of the investigation the public has access to. Even in states like Texas and Utah, the public has access to more information. In Texas, if the complaint is sustained, if they say, yes, this officer violated our rules, then the public has access to information about the investigation and what happened and what kind of discipline was imposed. In California, we have the most, the, about the most secretive laws in the nation and have no access to any of this basic information. In order for there to be trust between communities and law enforcement, there has to be accountability. 
We have to know that complaints of misconduct that are found to be true are taken seriously, that discipline is imposed, that people are held responsible when they make mistakes. We need to know that there's accountability. To have accountability, we need to have transparency. This is one of the most important issues that we've got to address in California law. So far, we have not been able to get a legislature to introduce a bill that would do this, but we are working very hard to try and make that happen this year. And this is an issue we've dealt with for several years at the ACLU. Has anyone worked on this issue in the past? You've worked on this in the past. Put your hand up. <laughs> so it's something that this is a long-term goal that we have had with the ACLU, and we really want to take advantage of this moment now when the public is focused on police misconduct and police violence to say, if you want to know what happened, we have to change the laws. Another reform that we've heard talked about that's um, actually a bill has already been introduced on this idea is the investigation of police killings. When a police officer kills someone, who is responsible for doing the investigation and potentially the prosecution? And we at the ACLU support the idea of independent investigations. We do think that the, when the investigation is done by the local law enforcement department or the local district attorney, uh, often there is an actual conflict of interest. Always there is the appearance of a conflict of interest. And it is much better to have someone independent do the investigation. That said, the lethal incidents, the times when police kill people, are the most extreme, they focus our attention, and they are not as common uh, as other incidents. Right? So it's an important reform, but we don't view it as a priority because it doesn't address the core issue of what's going wrong. We have to address the everyday indignities that people of color are enduring at the hands of police. That is our number one priority at the ACLU. And that is why we are pushing to introduce a bill on racial profiling. Also an issue we have worked on for a very long time at the ACLU. Has anyone been part of a prior campaign on racial profiling? So this is something we have fought hard in the past, and we are going to make our top priority this year. Uh, the bill has not been introduced yet, but we are feeling very encouraged that we will get a bill introduced. Our goals are first to strengthen the definition of racial profiling in California law. We have a weak definition that we were able to pass, but we really, it doesn't, it doesn't really have much teeth to it. So we would like to strengthen the definition and make it similar to the new definition that Eric Holder promulgated on the federal level that has much more teeth in it than the definition under California law. We also want to mandate data collection. We want to require actual collection at the local law enforcement level of what police are doing in terms of who are they stopping, who are they searching, whose cars are being impounded, and who's being arrested as a result of these searches. When I say who, what is the race, ethnicity, and other demographic information about the people. That kind of information, collecting that kind of data, lets us know what's actually happening on the local level. And again, it's not just about collecting it, right? The AG is collecting information about law enforcement, lethal use of force. It's about collecting it and releasing it to the public in a manner that we can make use of, right? In a way that all of us can look at it and understand and apply it at the local level. We're not just looking for statewide statistics that don't let us know what's happening in Sacramento, that let us, let us know what's happening with the Sacramento police versus the Sacramento sheriff. It really is important that we collect the information and that we release it to the public in a usable form. And then we need to use the information. I've been telling legislators the story about a report uh, that Julia Mass in our office did about a complaint we received, I think it was in Modesto area. We got complaints from community members that the cars of Latino community members were being towed. They were being stopped, detained, and their cars disproportionately towed. So Julia did an investigation, looked at the police reports from CHP from the area, and it was pretty apparent from their report that there were two officers in CHP who were disproportionately stopping Latinos and their cars were being towed. And you could really, it was very, came very clear from the data, it wasn't every officer, it was two. And we knew who they were. 
And so we put out this report. We didn't actually didn't name the officers, but we went to CHP. And we said, here are your officers. You have a problem. They denied it, of course, and publicly the ACLU was crazy, something like that. Said all those negative things <laughs> that led to people say, oh. Nobody even knows what they're saying. It's yes. They just know there's something. Right. Exactly. But it changed. The community members said, it's not happening anymore. We're not seeing the same kind of pattern of misconduct. So that's what you can do with data on racial profiling. You can actually identify a problem and propose a solution. We would love to have a bill that went even further. It would actually create incentives for local law enforcement to create a plan for actually addressing racial disparities and promoting racial justice in their community and actually create markers so that you could measure progress along your plan to actually achieving those goals. We don't know if we're going to get all of that. One of the frustrations of the legislative process is that uh, you know, we never get everything that we ask for, uh, but you have to ask for a lot. One of my, um, when I was a public defender, one of my colleagues said, if you're not asking for too much, you're not asking for enough. So we will start out asking big, <laughs> knowing that we will probably have to compromise. So these are the big fights we expect to have in the legislature this year. And they will be big fights. We should um, have no illusions about that. The reason why we have not been able to achieve these goals in the past is because law enforcement unions are extremely powerful in Sacramento. They are powerful because elected officials want their endorsement uh, for the, the atmospherics of having their local law enforcement unions support them. They are powerful because they give away lots of money. And that's one of the challenges that we face at the ACLU. We don't give elected officials money. We have to be persuasive based on the strength of our reasoning, based on the information we provide, and based on the support of our members, based on the strength of your voice. That is what gets them to listen to us in the legislature. So we are going to need all of your help this year, because these are big fights. We are taking on a big Goliath, uh, but we've got our slingshot, and we are loading up all of our rocks, and we are going to need your help uh, to really, for what we have been trying to achieve for decades, really taking this moment right now and putting everything we have into it and achieving serious, long overdue reform. So I'm going to stop there, and I hope we will have a good discussion. Yes. I'm retired field representative for the California Correctional Peace Office. Excellent. And it is true that law enforcement unions put a lot of money into electing legislators who are um, listening to the problems that, that the law enforcement community has. But the re one of the main reasons for that is, unlike other unions, law enforcement unions cannot strike. Mm. They have no power to withhold their labor to gain the things they need to gain through collective bargaining. Mm. So the legislature is the place where they can obtain the power to make the changes. So the best way to go about stopping the large amounts of money going to legislatures and making those kind of quid pro quo um, that goes on <clears throat> is to give public employees, all public employees, firefighters, all of them, the right to withhold their labor in a dispute, which is the key to a union's power, which is denied a lot of public employees. Um, teachers have recently overcome that and where they can strike, um, but law enforcement and firefighters can't. So rather than try and eliminate the funding, you eliminate the need for it by giving those officers the rights of any other union member
to withhold their labor in a dispute with their employer. That's interesting. You know, I've never had made that connection and thought about that issue, but I appreciate you bringing that up. That's an interesting point. That is something we will talk to more folks about. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, I was wondering why you never talked about internal affairs. They, they like dirty cops. They like locking them up in a resident and stuff. You know, like, a part of being a cop, you know, man, like, I guess you get to go on track, man, like, you ain't gonna follow no Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -hmm. That's not no uh, no no religious uh, graffiti. You know what I mean? Right. You have to go to where where they sell drugs, where they do the the anti-social hustle, you know, and so forth and so forth. Like you know, like if you're driving down the street at four o'clock in the morning, seeing some guy man with the red outfit, like in his fifties, throwing funny hand signs, or you think man, I like need to gonna get a Boy Scout, maybe with Boy Scout to get R.I.P. for the sell drugs. So when I talk about uh, transparency of police records, that does include internal affairs investigations. So in the ideal world, we would actually have access to the internal affairs investigations like they do in places like Florida. Yeah, a lot of cops like to be like a DEA or Homeland Security, but they can't because they got that jacket. The ones the cops put that jacket on, they can't even look no more. Right. They got to retire or just come out all the time. Right, right. That we think transparency would get to some of those issues. Yeah. Uh, are you going to be supporting Kevin McCartney's bill about to put together a group of individuals outside of law enforcement to actually look at police killings, look at police um, issues? Have you heard of this? I mean, it's a brand new bill. It's going to be coming out by by uh, Kevin McCartney. And we brought it up when we met with the district attorney's office, which, by the way, is now starting again their own investigation on police killings and mm -hmm. police um, issues. But they were concerned about it themselves. They did not want to see an oversight committee to make themselves transparent. So we've been having conversations with his office about the bill that has been introduced so far, which is really a placeholder, doesn't have a lot of content, um, uses the language of independent investigation. So we've been having conversations with him about different forms that could take. I haven't heard specifically the way you describe it, but we're definitely talking to his office about what we would like to see in such a bill. So whether we'll actually support it depends on what actually the decisions they make, but we're definitely engaging with them and hoping it turns into something that we want to support. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I wonder if uh, all of what you say in terms of transparency and the forms in terms of controls on behavior of police sounds like very important stuff. But I wonder, what's the, the work that is ongoing, or is there any such thing, understanding the culture and psychology of the police departments that gets to the behavior mm -hmm. that you're trying to control? Right, so there have been so, conversations about, particularly the Attorney General's mm -hmm. office has been talking about, um, this is what, what I have heard that relates to, it doesn't exactly address what you're saying, but conversations about, uh, improving the training of law enforcement in the category of implicit bias. So they, law enforcement is, the standard police officer training involves training on racial sensitivity, multicultural sensitivity, um, but doesn't yet specifically address implicit bias. And there are some departments that do specific training on that issue. So that is the thing that the Attorney General, for example, has proposed, that we require training on implicit bias. It doesn't exactly get to what you're saying in terms of understanding the real culture of law enforcement. I, out, outside of the legislature, in terms of, sort of other groups that we work with and activists, I've heard people talk about how could we get to um, what, what other folks have described as the hyper-masculine culture of law enforcement. But I haven't heard that actually reach the point of the legislature thinking about doing something. It doesn't sound like a legislative uh issues so much, yeah. but what you're talking about is, is, is responding to behavior uh, or trying to prevent behavior that's occurring, but not getting at, at the source of, of where it's really coming from. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, if you have thoughts on that, I do think it's a place where we need more ideas of how to actually get it. What is the cultural element that creates mm -hmm. these dynamics? I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I apologize if this is well covered, and I just don't know. Um, but with the body camera issue, I get the privacy issues at hand, um, especially with some more prominent and can see everything. 
but with micro camera technology and with motion sensor technology, has a camera on the gun been something that's been passed around? Because then it would activate as soon as it's taken out of the holster, it would be aimed directly at the target. It would be hard to bring up any privacy issues because mm -hmm. once they pulled it out of their holster, anything that's being recorded should be public knowledge. Yes, and that is being discussed. The problem with that is that we need to know what happened before the gun was pulled. Sure. So that, it, it misses some of the key information of what was the encounter that led up to the officer actually engaging with the weapon. But that is something that's being discussed. Um, one of the, actually, Taser International, which makes tasers, makes one of the popular body cams. So they are promoting uh, a body cam that is essentially triggered by engaging your weapon. So that is a possibility that's out there. Yeah. Listen, the camera made the police officer in a certain sense more responsible because yeah. she or he is concerned about a a violent and that cameras will show that. Because you take a look at strangulation in New York, and that was filmed with great clip mm -hmm. and, and showed I mean I, I honestly no, I tried to look at it the other way. It's impossible. I mean that may have yeah. Right. And yet, when it went to the grand jury, they discounted it mm -hmm. and bought the police officer's testimony. So, is is the purpose of that camera being up the, to provide evidence that perhaps might uh, exonerate the victim, right? Or is it to make the police officer more leery or both? It's. It's primarily to make them more leery. So it is both, but research shows in the departments that are actually using cameras, a significant number of departments already deploy body cameras. And in fact, the research shows that the number of misconduct complaints and the use of force complaints have dropped in the, in the departments that use them. So it is important to capture what happened, but the deterrent effect is actually significant. Right. There's also an issue with a lot of cameras. If an officer can review that, video before yes. he makes his, uh, writes his report out. Yes, that is an important thing that we need to make sure. So, you know, if the officer is allowed to see, particularly in lethal use of force situations where someone has been killed by the officer, what we don't want is the officer to view the footage before he makes his official statement about what happened, uh, which gives him or her an opportunity to tailor the story to what they see. That is an important thing we have to make sure they're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um. I always thought that uh, when there's a predicament, you know what I mean, that if it's anything violent or drugs, they always get the sergeant to do the paperwork. To make sure it, 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 I, it's yeah. or they won't break the law. I think that really varies with the department and the incident, but I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, there's definitely questionable there's practices in, in some, some places. And, and rank and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yes? It's so that all we're caught in the prison crisis in California seems like a window to end the war on drugs, which we've never been anywhere near close to before. I'm just wondering if the ACL is going to try to. Yes. So one of our major priorities was addressing the felony, uh, the fact that possession of simple, simple possession of drugs was a felony in California, and we've been working on that, trying to enact that reform to change it to be a misdemeanor for many years. Uh, and in fact, we accomplished that through Prop 47. Prop 47 was passed by the voters in November, and as a result of that, the simple possession of drugs and low-level property crimes are now all misdemeanors in California. Uh, so we, we have worked on a couple of other drug reform bills over the years, but that has been our number one priority. And now a lot of attention is shifting to uh, marijuana legalization to make marijuana recreational use of marijuana um, to make it lawful and tax it and regulate it. So the ACLU has, again, been preparing for this for a long time, but we are anticipating a ballot initiative in 2016 on marijuana legalization. And one of the reasons we prioritize this issue, um, you know, some people think, oh, marijuana legalization, it's about, you know, some people having the right to smoke in their, in their yard or in their home. And you can look at it through that lens. But for the ACLU, the reason why we prioritize marijuana legalization is that we do believe it is a key piece of the war on drugs. And that um, undoing the prohibition on marijuana use is one of the biggest steps forward we can take to dismantle the war on drugs. Uh, and so that is why it's a priority. And it's definitely, we're looking at 
other opportunities. But honestly, with the passage of Prop 47, marijuana legalization becomes the next big thing that will advance our effort to end the war on drugs. Now, if you're a validated gay member, because you're, if you're gone to prison, are you eligible for the Prop 47? Because is that, if you're a gay member, then you're, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a high risk, or is it considered a high yeah. risk? Yeah, um, so there are some, there are some prior convictions that make you not eligible for Prop 47 release. Uh, just being a validated gang member is not on the list. Um, so I can't name all of the all of the crimes that do make you not eligible, but they include things like murder and sex crimes. Um, but but being a validated gang member would not prohibit you from getting Prop 47 relief, and having been to pres prison would not prevent you from getting Prop right, 47. Right, because I see an overflow of prisons because you have these um, young men of color who are being validated in the courtroom when they've never ever had any validations yeah. before, but they plan they. they validated there in the courtroom with no evidence. And so now you have a, a kid who was looking at two years, looking at 18 years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, they validate them. Yeah, and even before that, the when they are um, putting people into gang databases without validating without them, right? The, it's just the officer deciding that somebody is a gang member, taking their photo and putting them in a gang database leads to enormous consequences for people who have... And that have. person isn't notified. Yeah. And you're not notified, you can't contest it. Yeah. But, you know, what was thrown out is saying now they have a juvenile uh, where you know, they'll notify the parents, but what if your parents are on drugs or your parents homeless or you have a parent that's not going to fight for you and not go to court? Oh, and a juvenile mm -hmm. will automatically be validated gang member because you don't have a parent that's going to go to court. Well, and they don't provide you any notice of putting you in the gang database. The police will put you in the gang database and never tell you that. And so we have had several cases of innocent people who were wrongfully convicted, and it was a mistaken eyewitness identification cases where the reason their photo was put in front of the witness in that photo identification spread, the reason the police had their photo and put it in the spread is because they were stopped on the street and some officer took their photo and decided they were a gang member. And they had no prior arrest, no police contact at all, but because of that, the police had their photo, and they get picked out in this lineup and wrongfully convicted, and it takes decades. Literally, this happened to Frankie Carrillo, a great man that we work with, spent 19 years in prison for a murder he did not commit because he was on his bike as a 16-year-old, stopped by the police in the park, they took his photo and put him in a gang database. No gang involvement at all. So yeah, these these are other issues that we are definitely working on. The worst scenario is you go to court and you have registered as a gang member, you're out, and now you have the fear of guns being drawn every time you pull over. Yeah, there there are some conversations about a bill to create a process for getting out of those gang databases and getting out from under the registration. I don't know if that'll move forward this year, but it is something that we are in conversations with some coalition partners about. Yeah. Uh, going back to the, the, the Black Lives Matter and how everything, the, the, the tension of the nation is on, on that issue. Uh, something very similar happened in California a few years before, you know, Santa Rosa, with a, a young boy named Andy Lopez who had a, a toy gun and was shot. And I remember watching the DA explain why it is that she decided not to uh, uh, file anything and pretty much not to indict. And she showed all the pictures, she showed, she showed the evidence, and I remember thinking then, like, well, who was making Andy Lopez's case? 14-year-old boy that just got shot. Yeah. Um, is there any is there any uh, any bill that change the way the indictment process works, or uh, is that gonna, is there anything in the future for that? There's some discussion of that as part of the Kevin McCarty bill. We don't know if that will end up. It's something an issue that he is interested in, mm -hmm. uh, and so we've also been approached by legislators who have wanted to ask questions about the grand jury process, whether these cases should be allowed to go to grand jury, or whether we should require another process be used. So I would say there's interest in that, and there's conversation, but I don't know yet if that's actually going to move forward in this legislative process. Yeah. Um, back to your profiling issue. Mm -hmm. um, part of the screening process for law enforcement officers in the state of California is to Miles Miller, um, I'm sorry, it's a psychological test that they give Meyer Miller. Meyer Briggs or Briggs Meyer or something? Is that, there's a different one. It is a different one. Okay. Um, when I was working for CCPLA, one of the things that I did was some research on that 
on that exam. And I talked to one of the people in the University of Michigan who is and has been involved in researching that test. It's really a personality um, assessment test, mm -hmm. not really a psychological test. And he told me that throughout the country, correctional officers, within two years of going on the job, can no longer pass that test the way they did before. Oh, that's interesting. And street law enforcement officers have a five-year window huh. where they no longer can pass that test. If something was done so that an officer could have the kind of counseling that they need to keep from getting this biased attitude mm -hmm. that um, comes from dealing with, in the correctional setting, manipulative and um, criminals and officers on the street having that never knowing whether this stop is going to be the one where they pull a gun or whether or not you know it's just Joe Citizen that they're going to be talking to. It's kind of like post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And so if they got the counseling they needed, then they could, I think, do better on the profile. And part of the problem is, is if an officer goes to counseling, then, especially correctional officers, the state does a fitness for duty mm. review on them, which um, oftentimes they end up losing their jobs. Right. Whereas they're trying to get their heads straight so they can be better at their jobs. Those are really interesting points. I'm glad you raised that. Well, we all have further conversations about whether there's something we can go with there. So I saw two more hands, and I think here, it's here. almost time. Yeah, okay. I saw. I saw. Oh, there, oh, was there one here, and then you? Hold on. Go. You know this. Uh, I use it very much. That the cops should have this and that, so many things. But I witnessed myself, even the, the detectives in, in district attorney's office, they framed the evidences. You know, they wanted you to convict. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, uh, you can catch them, so what? They will tell you, okay, fine, if, if you want to catch me, no problem, I will also take you to, to, the, to the jail, no mm -hmm. problem. So what I'm trying to say here, in this Sacramento area, you know, one of the point, uh, this, uh, the new attorney, new district attorney raised that, mm -hmm. that I will not act on the guidelines of the old district attorneys because nothing happens here. The old district attorney refused to take any action against any cop, mm -hmm. any cop, you know, uh, and they framed the evidences yeah. openly. Yeah. Not far from here, uh, we have many houses, so not far from here, we were having two houses, we housed the uh, what do you call it? Homeless people. And what happened that the county came in and they took the houses from us. And then there was a fire. The people died, killed. And we went to the court and you know, and there's another way, the discrimination in court. You know, how can we stop that? You know, then we went to the court again one time, second time, third time. One guy died, there's another fire, there's another fire, and the court says, no, they are not going to take the properties away from the county. So in other words, what I'm saying is that even if you catch them, nothing is going to happen. That's the story of Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's why ensuring that we have transparency and accountability is critically important. Right? We need to know when we make complaints against police officers that they are being taken seriously, that action is being taken, that people are being disciplined. And to get access to that information, we need to have transparency. We need to end California's secretive police laws. Okay, last question over here. Okay, now, back in the 90s, they changed a whole bunch of laws to make really petty crimes and major felonies, right? This way, man, they have all these rehab programs that they can make money because the company is a money making business. Almost everything is a money making business. They make money off everything. Okay, now, these people have to go to drug or had to go to counseling, had to jump through the news to get doing drugs and so forth, like 
so many years, 10 years, can they go back and get those? Is it retroactive? How far back can they get their case as a felony that really mm -hmm. was a misdemeanor? But every, every the Sacramento, like every other town in America, yes. if you get busted for a misdemeanor, they give you a felony. Yes, so this is an important point. Prop 47 is completely retroactive. So if you were convicted of a felony for drug possession or a low-level uh, property crime, you can go to court and have that conviction reduced to a misdemeanor, and then you can have it dismissed off your record if you have successfully completed probation, if you've done all your time. But there's a time limit. I think it's only two years that people have to actually pursue this relief. So it is something that we are working on very hard at the ACLU. Prop 47 was a great victory. It is an opportunity for over 100,000 people to correct their record and reduce felony convictions down to misdemeanors and then potentially dismiss them. Over 100,000 people could get help through Prop 47. It's a lot of people that need access to a lot of lawyers in a very short amount of time. So that is something we're working with our coalition partners to make sure that people get the information and get access to court. So I think now we are officially out of time. So I want to thank you all for a lively conversation.